Hi. The first topic is embryology of the central nervous system. Here you have drawings of an embryonic disc. First, the epiblastic cells migrate towards the caudal end of the embryonic disc. As more epiblastic cells migrate, they accumulate on the back of the embryonic disc. Here you have a cheek embryo, and this accumulation of epiblastic cells, they form what is known the primitive streak. As more cells accumulate, the primitive streak gets longer. On the left, you have an image of a cheek embryo. And the, this image is on a stage three Hamburger and Hamilton. Here, the primitive streak has grown about two thirds of the length of the embryonic disc. At this level, the primitive streak has become a groove that is called primitive groove. A stage four hamburger than Hamilton, the primitive groove has grown longer and the rostral end of this primitive groove, it is called the Henson's node or primitive node, right here. Remember that in mammals, the primitive groove doesn't grow as far Russell as in birds. Now we talk about a first migration. Here you have a chick embryo and the drawing of this chick embryo with the primitive growth, groove. So the epiblastic cells, they keep migrating towards the primitive groove. And they fell in this groove, sorry, they fell in this groove and they travel and they move up until the hypoblast cell, uh, until the hypoblast layer. So what they do is they move the hypoblastic cells towards the lateral aspect of the embryo. And they replace the hypoblastic cells and the cells that are located at this level now are the endoderm. So they form the endoderm. However, the hypoblastic cells, they do not disappear. They accumulate on the lateral aspects of the embryo and they form the extra embryonic endoderm. Then a second migration of epiblastic cells takes place. Then the cells, they keep coming to the primitive groove. And what they do is they enter this groove and instead of occupying the underlying layer that now is the endoderm, they occupy the layer between the outermost layer that now still is the epiblastic cells and the endoderm. So they form a mid layer that is the mesoderm. Now also cells from the epiblastic, epiblastic cells, they from the rostral a uh, rostral part of the embryo, they fell in the more rostral part of the primitive groove, that is the Henson's node. As they do all this migration, the primitive groove moves caudally, and then all this outermost layer of the embryo is now replaced by cells that are not migrating anymore, and they become the ectoderm. We have to remember that some cells that are from the rostral part of the embryo, that they have migrate to the primitive groove, they move not also laterally, but rostrally, and they accumulate rostral to the Henson's node, and they are going to form the precordal plate. Now, if we make a longitudinal section of an embryo, what do we have? We have the endodermal layer, the endoderm, and the most uh, external layer, okay? That is uh, some cells are ectoderm, but such, some cells are still epiblastic cells that are migrating towards the Henson's node and they fell into the groove and they accumulate on the midline of the embryo. 
in order to form the axial mesoderm that is the notochord. <clears throat> On the rostral to the notochord, we have the precordal plate. That is going to be very, very important later on. As more cells fell into the groove at the Hansen's node and they formed the notochord, the Hansen's node moves caudally. So moving caudally, it progresses the formation of the axial mesoderm or notochord. In the embryo, not, uh, the, uh, the, all the stages uh, somehow overlap. <clears throat> what I mean, here you have images taken from this book. Sorry, taken from this book. And what you have here is that the Henson's node has progressed colorly. There you have the primitive groove. And rostral to the Henson's node, all this ectoderm has begun a folding, okay, that uh, to become the, uh, to start forming the neural tube, okay? So then the primitive groove has progressed caudally and then more caudally, and as you see, there are folds that are coming together to meet at the mid-plane and to form the future neural tube with two openings, a rostral neuropore and a caudal neuropore. Here you have a cheek embryo with the rostral neuropore still open, it will close later on, and then you have the caudal neuropore that has progressed caudally. So the first neuropore to be closed is the rostral one. Then we come to the stage of the formation of the neural tube. This process is called neurulation. Okay? When neurulation occurs, the embryo is called a, neuro, a, a neurula. Okay, you have it here. So the process takes place in two stages. One is the anterior or primary neurulation responsible for the formation of the encephalon and most of the spinal cord. And then a posterior or secondary neurulation that is responsible for the formation of caudal and last sacral spinal segments here. This process of secondary neurulation starts after the closure of the caudal neuropore. So how is this gonna take place? This represents a transverse section of the embryo with the ectoderm in yellow, the mesoderm in red, pink, and the endoderm in green. As you see dorsal to the notochord, the axial mesoderm, the ectodermal cells increase in height and appear on special cells, here are marked in blue, that are on the lateral aspect of this elevation. These cells are very important. Are, they are going to become the neural crest cells. So this elevation now is called neural plate. As more cells are added to the ectodermal layer, they push these lateral aspects of the neural plate dorsally. At the same time, this, the height of the cells of the neural plate diminish. So this process is the responsible for the formation of the neural canal between two neural folds. As the process continues, the neural folds uh, approach at the midplane and they uh, contact, they contact to form a tube that is the neural tube. When these two neural folds contact, these cells are migrating, they detach from the ectodermal layer and they migrate ventrolaterally. These are the neural crest cells. It is important to notice that in birds, the migration of these neural crest cells takes place after the closure of the neural tube. However, in mammals, the migration at the head region starts before the closure. And at the rest of the embryo, they migrate after the closure of the neural tube. So now we have to talk about where these neural folds start to meet because they start to meet at one point. 
And in chick embryos, they start to meet at the mid lane at the, at the site of the midbrain. And they progress rosally and caudally. So the new rosal neuropore will close earlier than the caudal neuropore. In mouse, takes place first in the hindbrain cervical boundary. And another location is at the forebrain midbrain and a third location in the future forebrain. In humans, there are also three sites where these neural folds start to meet. This process may lead to neural tube defects, whether they are affecting the cranial neuro neural tube or the spinal neural tube. In particular, here you have cheek embryos, two cheek embryos, and the first one, this one, is uh, has an anencephaly. The rostral neuropore fails to close. And here you have another one with an exencephaly, the absence of the cranial vault. And in these cases, the brain tissue protrudes out of the cranial cavity and usually is not covered by skin. And then here you have an hydrocephalus. Okay. As you see, the lateral ventricles are very distended. Development abnormalities may affect, sorry about that. Development abnormalities may affect the rachis on, and also the spinal cord. Here you have a rachis schisis where the uh, neural arch has not developed or fails to develop and close in at the midplane. Rachiskysis may be presented with myeloskysis, where the neural tube has not developed. When there is an incomplete development of the arches, we call it spina bifida. And also, the spina bifida may be presented with a meningocele or with a myelomeningocele. Other malformations may be diplomyelia, where there is a longitudinal duplication of the spinal cord, or a diasto, diastematomyelia where there is a splitting of the spinal cord, but the two spinal cords are separated by bony tissue. Here you have a spina bifida of a cheek embryo. Other malformations will be, or maybe the dermoid sinus here, this is a case of a dog, is a tubular sac extending from the dorsal midline into the underlying tissues. You have it on transverse sections or hydromyelias or syringomyelias. Look at the uh, central canal of the spinal cord that is enlarged. Secondary neurulation starts caudal to the caudal neuropore, once the caudal neuropore is closed. Here you have, again, you have a cheek embryo, the image enlarged. There is a condensation of mesodermal cells that form what is known the end or tail bud. So how these two neural tubes are going to fuse? In the case of chicks, the, fur, the, the neural tube that has developed through the primary, or primary neurulation overlaps this, the neural tube that has been formed through secondary neurulation and they form a single tube. This is the notochord, the notochord. In the case of a mouse, the tube that develops from or through secondary neurulation cavitates and joins the tube that has developed through primary neurulation in order to form a single tube. In humans, this tube, this condensation of mesodermal cells that have 
undergone a recapitalization in order to form uh, an, uh, the caudal portion of the neural tube, they do not cavitate and they join the neural tube that has been developed, that has developed through the primary neurulation. And the cavity of this tube extends in the tube that is going to become, that has developed through secondary neurulation. It is important to notice that some, sorry, that some screw tails in dogs are the result of a failure in the secondary neurulation. Now we are going to talk about the architecture of the central nervous system. Here is a transverse section of the neural tube, an embryo, in an embryo, and we are going to look at the wall of this. If we look in detail, we see that there are many nuclei that are scattered among the, the, the wall of this tube. It means that the nuclei that are close to the ventricular zone, close to the center, are the nuclei that are in mitosis. And the nuclei that are on the most outer part of the wall of the neural tube are in interface. What is going to happen? So these neuronal stem cells that are close to the ventricular zone, they divide and one of the cells remain close to the nuclei, remain close to the ventricular zone. However, all the cytoplasm attached to both ends. And then the, one of the resulting cells, what they do is they keep attached to both ends of the wall of the neural tube. However, the nucleus moves towards an outer part of the wall of the neural tube. And they are in interface. This process takes place constantly. So neural stem cells divide by mitosis. A becomes B and C. And then once they have undergone mitosis, their nuclei move and they are located in the outermost part of the wall of the neural tube. One of the cells comes down again, the nucleus comes down again, keeping both ends of the cytoplasm attached to both ends of this wall of the neural tube and divides again by mitosis. But then in this case, the D, B becomes D and E, D what it does, it, sorry, D what it does, it goes up, goes up and stays in interface. And E detaches from the ventricle zone and moves towards an external area and becomes, may become a neuroblast, basal progenitor or radial glial cells. And the process is repeated. This means that first we have a symmetrical or horizontal division. And then this division comes to be an asymmetrical or vertical division. Let's look at it in a different perspective. We have neuronal stem cells that divide in neuronal stem cells by mitosis. This is a symmetrical or horizontal division, very close to the ependymal cell layer. But then some of these neuronal stem cells, they become another, they but when they divide, they may become radial glial cells, neuroblasts, or uh, basal progenitors. They have also, they may remain as uh, neural stem cells. Then we have started an asymmetrical vertical division because one of the neuroblasts will become a neuron, radial glial cells, may become, may divide and end in radial glial cells or produce neuroblasts or produce basal progenitors, etc. Okay. Radial glial cells are very important because they keep attached to both ends and they serve the purpose of these radial glial cells it, to help migrating newly formed neurons towards the most Outer, outer, outer layer of the wall of this neural tube, okay? 
once the radial glial, radial glial cells, uh, they do not disappear once they have uh, done their purpose, some of them may transform in astroglial cells and even neurons. Okay, to understand this process, imagine a venue. Okay, here we have the stage. Okay, and all these people that are gathered very close to the stage are at the ependymal cell layer. The, the layer that this more is the, in the inner in the inner area. Okay, they are cells. And these cells are producing more cells. These people are producing more people. If these newly formed people accumulate or very close to the, to the stage, as more people are produced, they will have to push everyone backwards. The best way is to jump over the people and allow the people to move you towards the back of the arena. And this is what is happening. These arms are glial, radial glial cells. And all these cells are, imagine this guy is a neuron, so it's transported towards the back. So the newly formed cells are located in the back of this arena, or so in the most uh, external areas of the neural tube. This is what is called a radial migration that is characteristic of the cerebral cortex. However, there are other, ty other types of migration, like tangential migration, parallel to the PL surface. This tangential migration takes place in the brainstem, telencephalon, rhombic lips, midbrain, and also in the spinal cord. Now we'll look at the organization of the spinal cord. Okay, here we have a drawing. The yellow cells are the ependymal cell layer or the most inner layer. The cells are produced at this level and they move towards an outermost part of the neural tube in order to form the mantle layer, okay? And in this case, as we end the spinal cord, all the axons will accumulate peripherally, in the periphery, okay, to form the white matter. If we make a, a section and we divide this spinal cord into portions, a dorsal or alar plate and a ventral or basal plate, we see here as this is in this, these are sections of this, sorry, of the spinal cord of a dog, dorsal and ventral, dorsal and ventral. The dorsal portion are sensory and the ventral or basal plate, basal portion is motor, sensory motor, sensory and motor. And here as well, the most outer portion, the most dorsal portion of the alar plate is involved in somatic sensory. And the more ventral portion of the basal plate is involved in somatic motor. Whereas all these areas very close to the mid lane are for visceral, whether they are sensory or motor. For the case of the encephalon, the more rostral end of the neural tube starts to form vesicles. These are the, pro this is a cheek embryos, these are cheek embryos. We have the prosencephalon, this is for the mesencephalon, and this is for the rhombencephalon. These words come from Greek. Prosencephalon means the most extend, most outermost, the more rostral one. The mes in the mid mesencephalon mids, means in the middle. And rhombencephalon, it means rhombus. Why? Okay, imagine a tube of gardening for watering in the garden. If you flex it dorsally, ex uh, the, the tube extends laterally and forms like a rhombus. Okay, this is what it happens here. Then the prosencephalon, the prosencephalon, this one vesicle starts to divide in three vesicles. Two vesicles appear on the lateral aspect. These are the telencephalic vesicles. Again, comes from Greek, meaning on the streams. And the vesicle that remains in the middle is the diencephalon, that means in between. The mesencephalon remains as it is, and the rhombencephalon divides into portions. The metencephalon, that means after, 
and the myelencephalon that means more long than wide. Okay, this tube, while it's forming the vesicles, starts to flex ventrally. And the responsible for this flexion ventrally of this rostral portion of the neural tube is the precordial plates. The precordial plate ventralizes the brain and also regulates the development of the hypothalamus and separates a single eye field into two optic primordia. These are the optic vesicles. And then the first flexure to appear is the mesencephalic flexure. Sorry. As, more, uh, as the telencephalic vesicles start to appear, another flexure appears as well. One is the cervical flexure that is between the rhombencephalon and the spinal cord, and another one is the pontine flexure on top of the rhombencephalon. And as these flexures deepen, the telencephalic vesicle starts to grow following this dotted arrow. So it grows rosso, dorso, caudally. This is the reason why most of the structures of the cerebral hemispheres have a C shape because the telencephalic vesicles will develop as cerebral hemispheres. Here you have a cheek embryo alive. Okay. Okay, you have it here. And then you have it here. So you see a big eye, the mesencephalon, the rhombencephalon, and the prosencephalon here. So this is the same embryo with the eye, the mesencephalon, the prosencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. You see rhombencephalon here. This is, this is the rhombencephalon, mesencephalon, and prosencephalon with the vesicles, the diencephalon and the telencephalic vesicles. So the prosencephalon gives rise to the forebrain that is formed by the cerebral hemispheres and the rostral portion of the brainstem. The mesencephalon develops as the midbrain, and the rhombencephalon forms the hind brain that forms the cerebellum, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So, as the telencephalic vesicles keep growing by radi mostly by radial migration, remember that what it means. This is this is a the neocortex, this is the, a, a section of the neocortex that has layers, is a column of the neocortex. So it means that the layer that is more external is the last layer that has been developed. The first one is the most inner layer. This process of formation of the neocortex develops and is achieved after birth. Another important thing is to remember that in the cerebrum there are there is gray matter forms the core the cerebral cortex, but also nuclei collections of neural cell bodies included in the white matter. So this collection of nuclei, one the, in the in the development, forms the lateral striated body. This lateral striated body is split into portions by fibers of the white matter that form the internal capsule. So the lateral striated body is split in one that remains close to the, to the ventricle, that is the coded nucleus, and the other that is moved, that has been is moved laterally, that again is split into portions by associative fibers, the internal capsule, and is split in the putamen and claustrum. This is the reason why when we make a transverse section of an, of an encephalon, we identify the coated nucleus here, the coated nucleus, and also we identify here is the putamen and claustrum. And between the putamen and the coated nucleus, there are fibers that uh, united uh, the coated nucleus with the putamen through the internal capsule. And then the coated nucleus and the putamen are called together the striated body, just these two nuclei, not the rest of them. Another collection of nuclei is the medial striated body that is moved laterally to become the pallidum, 
that you have the pallidum, the pallidum, right? All the nuclei are moved again laterally at the amygdaloid body, or the thalamic nuclei that remain very close to the midline. And as you see in this image, this is a transverse section. This is a Bielchowski is the of this area, okay? And you see the part of the coded nucleus, the putamen, and the claustrum, and the pallidum here. So the internal capsule has a split this lateral striated body in the coated nucleus, the putamen and claustrum. However, the putamen remains partially attached to the coated nucleus. This is why this coded nucleus and the putamen, they are called together the striated body. Okay, about the cerebellum. The cerebellum develops from the metencephalon. What it happens is, is cells accumulate on both uh, lateral aspects of the metencephalon and they form the rhombic lips. This accumulation of cells keep, uh, keep growing and these both rhombic lips meet at the midplane in order to form the cerebellar plate. Now, I will remember the cells are produced very close to the ventricular zone and they form the mantle layer. And then cells from the mantle layer keep migrating to the outermost part of the wall of this cerebellar plate in order to form the cortical layer. Some cells then from the cortical layer migrate backwards and they are met by cells that are keeping migrating from the mantle layer in order to form the granular cell layer. The cells that remain in the cortical layer, they form the Purkinje cells. And the cells that remain very close to the lumen are the cerebellar nuclei. And as you see here, this is a transverse section. You see at the medulla oblongata, the cerebellum, part of the cerebral hemispheres. This is from a dog. And you see that these cerebellar nuclei are, remain very close to the ventricular zone. In the brain stem, this is going to be very similar to the spinal cord. If we make a, a, a section through the sulcus limitans, we have a dorsal or alar plate and a ventral or basal plate. And the cells of the mantle layer, they form columns. And functionally, it's going to be the same. The, the most dorsal column is sensory somatic. The most ventral column is motor somatic. And in between, we have the visceral columns, whether they are visceral or motor. It's a somatic arrangement. So look at this is a sections of a brain stem. This is at the level of the mesencephalon of a dog, okay? So what you have here, this is the uh, mesencephalic aqueduct. And the, here we have the oculomotor nucleus. The oculomotor nucleus is a motor nucleus, it's a somatic motor nucleus. Also, we have a visceral one, okay? But, and it's located ventrally. Again, the motor nucleus of the, tro of the trochlear nerve is located ventrally, it has a ventral location. We progress a bit more caudally in the medulla oblongata and we make a section through the sulcus limitans. Again, we have, what do we have here? We have here, we have the motor nucleus of the adjacent. And we have, this is motor. And then we have a vestibular nucleus, sensory, or the nucleus of the spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve, that is sensory as well. We move caudally. Again, we have the same. A section through the sulcus limitans. Eventually, we have a motor nucleus. What happened here? Some of the cells that were, they were forming columns in the embryo have moved to other locations, but they remain in the basal or in the, door, in the alar plate. So the basal plate are motor, the alar plate are sensory. We have the, again, the nucleus of the spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve or a vestibular nucleus. Or we move caudally again. We can make it the, the, the section again. So at the vent, at the basal plate, what do we have here? The motor nucleus of the hypoglossal nerve. 
Dorsally, one of them is the nucleus of the solitary tract, sensory. Again, or again here, the cunate nucleus, sensory. Ventrally, motor nuclei, or the ambiguous motor nucleus. Now we have to talk about the rhombencephalon. The rhombencephalon is divided in sections. Each section is a rhombomer. There are eight rhombomers and they are associated with cranial nerves in the rhombencephalon. We have to talk about the meninges as well. The meninges in the origin uh, the meninges that surround the prosencephalon are of two origins, from the neural crest or from the mesoderm. However, the meninges that surround the mesencephalon, rhombencephalon and the spinal cord, they derive from the mesoderm, not the neural crest cells. These meninges are two meninges. One ectomeninge, that is the giramata, here in red, and one endomeninge that are the leptomeninges that you know that is the arachnoid and the pia mater. So we, ha we have to talk as well about the choroid plexuses. You know that in the cephalon there are choroid plexuses on the roof of the third ventricle, in the lateral ventricles and in the, in the roof or on the roof of the fourth ventricle. What is happening here is happening that the ependymal cell layer contacts directly with the pia mater. There is no parenchyma at this point here. It's very thin, the, the wall of the, of the encephalon at these levels. So then it, all the vessels of the pia mater grow in this, in this area here. So the combination of the ependymal cell layer and the pia mater forms the telacoroidea. And then all the vessels create, uh, develop here in order to form the choroidal plexuses. For a better understanding of the developing of the uh, plexuses of the lateral ventricles, look at this drawing. This represents a transverse section of an embryo with a diencephalic vesicle and two telencephalic vesicles. As I said previously, the roof of the third ventricle or the encephalic vesicle is very thin and extends laterally and pushes inside the telencephalic vesicles or inside the lateral ventricles. And here, all the choroid plexuses develop. So the choroid plexuses of the roof of the third ventricle that are connected with the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricles. Okay. So if you have in these images, these are the lateral ventricles and in large image you have the choroidal plexuses of the lateral ventricles and the choroidal plexus of the third ventricle here on an MRI. For the fourth ventricle, again the telacoridea of the fourth ventricle is the support for the choroidal plexuses. These choroidal plexuses expand from the fourth ventricle through the lateral openings of the fourth ventricle into, sub, into the superarachnoid space. And here you have them on an MRI. It is important to notice as well the organization of the paraxial mesoderm because it's very important that. And you will see how and why. So what do we have here? We, do, we have a cheek embryo here, okay? And you see, this is a representation of the neural tube. And on the lateral aspects of the neural tube, there is a condensation of paraxial mesoderm that on the lateral aspects of the, at the level of the mesencephalon and rhombencephalon, they form the somitomerous. And then caudally, all these somitomerous are going to split in portions that they are called somites. And as you see, these somitomers are, aren't still split in somites. They are, aren't still divided in somites. A somite is paraxial mesoderm lateral to the neural tube. This is the notochord, the axial mesoderm. 
and in each somite we identify a myotome, a dermatome, and a sclerotome. And as you see in this image, the somite, the myotome, dermatome, and sclerotome. So what do you see? This is a transverse section of an embryo with an autocoat, the neural tube, and what is going to happen? The sclerotome, the cells of the sclerotome are starting to move and they move to surround, to surround the notochord and to surround the neural tube. Okay, these sclerotomes then are easily identified in each sclerotome two portions. This represents a neural tube, the two dorsal aorti. We are in a very first stage of development, the notochord in black and the intersegmentary arteries. So in each sclerotome, a rostral loose cranial portion, okay, and a portion that is caudal and is more dense. Okay. And this is important because we are going to have a process of resegmentation. So we have here the spinal cord in yellow with the segments. I have drawn just three segments. And here you have the sclerotomes with two portions the more rostral and loose portion and the more caudal or dense portion and a myotome. What is happening is the dense portion of an sclerotome starts to grow and moves caudally in order to contact the sclerotome that is located behind. And this is very important because this portion is going to become a vertebra. A vertebra then is derived from a more dense portion of an sclerotome and the loose portion of the rostral portion of the sclerotome that is behind. The rest of the loose portion of the sclerotome is going to become an intervertebral disc. This is very important because first, uh, each vertebra will be connected with two myotomes, so the animal will be able to move. And second, because each spinal nerve is going to leave uh, the, the vertebral canal at the location where the, uh, there is the intervertebral disc. You see that? You see that here I represent the neural tube in green, the notochord, and here you have the dense portion of an sclerotome. This dense portion of a sclerotome surrounds the notochord and also surrounds the neural tube. The loose portion of an sclerotome surrounds just the notochord and it becomes the annulus fibrosus and the nucleus pulp and the, no the, the notochord becomes the nucleus pulposus of an intervertebral disc. And here, the notochord that is surrounded by the most dense population of the sclerotome disappears. There are theories about that. One is regional apoptosis that leads to, to notochord removal. And another is the pressure of exerted by the surrounded vertebral body on the notochord pushes the notochord cells into the intervertebral disc region. Okay, the result is that the intervertebral disc is located at the, inter, at the foramen intervertebrale, intervertebral foramen. And this is important. Because you know there are neural crest cells. These neural crest cells have detached from the ectoderm and they have started migrating ventrolaterally. And they have what they have here. They have a problem. They have a condensation, a condensation of, of paraxial mesoderm. So in order to be able to cross the paraxial mesoderm, they do so through the loose portion of an sclerotome. Okay. Now, following that, here is a representation of an embryo, here is a cheek embryo, and then you see that this paraxial mesoderm has formed somitomerous, a uh, lateral to the mesencephalon and up to the rhombencephalon, for the, not, not all the rhombencephalon, sorry, not all the rhombencephalon, and these somitomerous are going to form the neurocranium. Do you remember that the neural crest cells participate in the splachnocranium? So, caudal to these seven somitomerous, they are somites. The ones that are located 
lateral to the most caudal portion of the rhombencephalon are the occipital sclerotomes, and these will form occipital anotic regions of the skull. Then somite 4 and 5 is going to form the proallas. This proallas will become the anterior, the anterior segment of this proallas is going to form the occipital condyles and the posterior segment, the articular surface of the atlas and the apex of the dens of the axis. Then somite 5 and 6 is going to form the atlas and the dens of the axis. Look at this image here. Look, you have the proatlas 4 and 5, the occipital condyles and articular surface of the apex of the dens of the axis. This comes from the proatlas S4, S5. S5 and 6, atlas and dens of the axis. Okay, the atlas and dens of the axis. And remember that the dens of the axis is inside the atlas. S6, S7, the axis, the rest of the axis. 7 and 8, C3, and so on. Okay. So now this is a representation of the, in brown, are uh, the paraxial mesoderm, the somitomerous and the somites, the occipital somites, S1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And now it is interesting to notice that the origin of the cranial nerves are related with this paraxial mesoderm in order to innovate muscles, you see. So we see that uh, cranial nerve abducens and cranial nerve oculomotor, six and three, are related to the somitomerous S3, S2, S1. And these somitomera or these somitomeras are related, or these, uh, the portion, the myotome of these uh, somitomeras moves to form part or to develop extraocular muscles, as well as somitomera 5, that is related with the abducens cranial nerve. Somitomera 4 is related with the origin of the trigeminal nerve, and this is moving towards the mandibular arch. Okay. And so all these masticatory muscles will be innervated by the trigeminus. And this is the very similar situation is going to happen with the somitomerous 6 that migrates to form the structures of the hyoid arch. So facial is, the facial nerve is related with this somitomerous. So they are innervated by the facial nerve and so on. And remember, look at somite 3, 4 and 5 forms a column cells that migrate rosally in order to form the tongue. So they are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve. So malformation of these vertebrae, we may have, in this case, this drawing represents that the, as you see, the sclerotome has surrounded the notochord, but it could happen that the notochord has not disappeared. So the vertebral body that results from this sclerotome migration is divided into portions. So we have a butterfly-like vertebra, as you see here or here. Also, we may have other problems. You remember that the vertebrae uh, develop and, and they undergo an endochondrial ossification. So there are four chondrification sites one for each half of a vertebral body and one for each half of the vertebral arch. It could happen that one of these chondrification sites or uh, points doesn't develop, so we may end up having a lateral hemivertebra, or maybe one of the sclerotomes does not develop. Or you know that then uh, there are going to appear two ossification sites one dorsal and one ventral in one vertebral body that eventually become just one. It could be possible that one of these ossification centers does not develop and then we have a dorsal hemivertebra. And thank you very much.